Take them and join me in Psalm chapter 16 this morning. Psalm chapter 16, as always, if you don't have a Bible, there should be a black Bible in the chair in front of you. You can turn to page 253, and today is Father's Day, so happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. We're grateful for all that you do for our families. So Psalm chapter 16 this morning, of course, we'll be looking at the entire psalm. Verse 1, this is the word of the Lord to us this morning. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply their drink offerings of blood. I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells securely. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we have had the opportunity to sing to you, to hear your word read, to pray to you. Now, Father, as we open your word to hear from you, these inspired and true words through David, Father, you would speak to us this morning. We pray, Father, that you would exalt your name and lift up who you are, and in doing so, that, Lord, we would behold our God and we would see your beauty and your majesty and your presence that has come to be with us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father, that we would be assured here this morning of the love and the acceptance and the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy that is given to us through Christ. We ask, Father, for your help here this morning. Fill us with your spirit to hear your word and to heed your word in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, have you ever found yourself in a situation where you tried to express what you were thinking or what you were feeling, and you were unable to do so, and then someone comes along and says perfectly what you were thinking or what you were feeling? Well, that's what the book of Psalms are for us. Of all the books of the Bible, only the Psalms are our words to God. If you think about the rest of the Bible, the Bible is God speaking to us, but the Psalms are our words to God. And the Psalms so often perfectly capture what we can't say for ourselves. This is why the Psalms have been loved for thousands of years. The Psalms touch on so many areas of our human existence. There's an honesty to the Psalms. The Psalms express our emotions, our suffering, our hopes, our joys, our fears, our sorrows. We can relate to the Psalms. Yes, the Psalms are ultimately written and inspired by God, but they were also written by human authors. Human authors, as they were inspired by God, expressing perfectly what we as God's people are often thinking and feeling. And for me here this morning, this is especially true with Psalm 16. I think most of you know that before I came here, I pastored a church in Nebraska for six years. And I left Nebraska to go plant a church in Denver, Colorado. We left a church that we loved. We left a church where we had deep, abiding relationships. We had great unity. God was working in the church. The church was on this upward trajectory. But I left the church. And after coming to Denver, I began to realize that I had made a mistake. I came to see that I wasn't gifted to do church planting work. Now, I believe in church planting. I think church planting is important. If God would ever bless our church beyond the size of this building, we should go plant a church. But church planting is not my gifting. I felt that I had made a mistake, but what I thought was a mistake was God's good discipline in my life. He was making me more like Jesus. He was humbling me. He was teaching me more about myself. I was becoming more self-aware about my strengths and my weaknesses. And in that time of uncertainty and doubt, Psalm 16 was medicine for my soul. I couldn't always express how I was thinking or how I was feeling, but this psalm expressed it perfectly for me. 
And so this psalm here this morning is very near and dear to my heart. And maybe for you here this morning, you've been through a tough situation where a psalm then has expressed perfectly what you were thinking and what you were feeling at the time in your life. Now, in many respects, this psalm is a continuation of Psalm 15, which we looked at last week. Remember Psalm 15:1, who can sojourn in your tent? Who can dwell on your holy hill? In other words, who can be with the Lord? In other words, who can enter God's presence? And the psalmist told us there in chapter 15, it is the one who is blameless. It is the one who does not slander. It is the one who honors and fears the Lord. But the question for us this morning, what does it look like to dwell in the presence of God? What does it mean to dwell in the presence of God? What are the implications of that for our lives? And that's what Psalm 16 answers for us. To dwell in the presence of God is to delight in God. It is to trust in God. It is to have a confidence in God. It is to find your security and your hope in God. Now, we don't know why David wrote this psalm. We don't know the historical context. But what we do discern is that this is a prayer to God, perhaps in a time of distress, perhaps in a time of peace. But either way, his prayer is focused on the sufficiency of God. His prayer is focused on the security that is found in God's presence. And David in this psalm tells us what it looks like and what it is like to dwell in the presence of God. He tells us what the presence of God means for our lives. And what his prayer tells us here this morning is that God's people can have confidence in God because his presence and his care is not just for this life, but his presence and his care is even for the next life. So here's what I think the psalmist is getting at for us this morning. God's people can trust and delight in the Lord because his presence and his care is forever. And we find three points here in the text this morning. We see David's confession in verses 1 through 4. We see David's confidence in verses 5 through 8. And then we see David's hope in verses 9 through 11. These are three separate points that we find here this morning. But really, each one of these ideas of confession and confidence and hope are spread all throughout this psalm. So notice what we have here, first of all. We see David's confession in verses 1 through 4. So notice here the orientation of David. David's orientation is towards God and his people. His direction is towards the Lord and his people, not evil. He delights and he trusts in the Lord. He sees the Lord's presence as his only source of satisfaction. Notice what he says here in the text. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. David knows that only the Lord can keep him. David knows that only the Lord can help him. And this is a confession of a man who not only knows that only God can help him, but this is a confession of a man who knows that only God can give him whatever he really needs. That's why David adds these words here. You are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. David's words here are not simply expressing that God is good or that God has given him good things. But he is expressing here that there is no good without God, that God is the ultimate good. And David has nothing if he doesn't have God. The Christian Standard Bible puts it well when it says this, I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have nothing good besides you. Asaph over in Psalm 73, 25 says something similar. Whom have I in heaven but you, and there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. I think with me for a moment who David is. David is the king of Israel. Maybe he isn't king yet, but he will be king. He is king. And if you think about what a king is, a king needs nothing. A king is not in want. Instead, it is the people who come to the king for things. It is the people who come to the king who are in want. But here David even recognizes his own limitations as king. He recognizes here that even though he may have everything as king, he has nothing if he doesn't have God. What would our lives be like if we had everything we could ever want, everything we could ever desire, everything we could ever possess, and yet we didn't have God? You see, that's the lie of the serpent. The lie of the serpent in the garden is that you can have it all without God and still find happiness. What is it in your life today that you think will give you happiness apart from the presence of God? And we may not think here this morning that there is something in our lives that will give us happiness and delight apart from God But where do we run when we face difficulties? Where do we turn when we go through trials? What do you do when you want something really badly, but you can't have it? You see, how we respond to those situations reveals truly where we find happiness, where we delight 
Do we delight in the presence of God or do we delight in something else? And yet, because God is our good, he does not withhold good things from us. He is not only our good, but because he is good, whatever he gives to us is always good. And because he is good, there is no limit to his goodness in our lives. That's the confidence that David has. His confidence is in the nature and the character of God. His confidence is in the goodness of God. And he confesses before God, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Now notice here what else David confesses, verses 3 and 4. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out and take their names on my lips. Not only does David here delight in the Lord, but David even confesses his delight, notice it here, in God's people. Typically, we think that our delight is to be only found in the Lord. And in the ultimate sense, it is. The people of God are not greater than God himself. God's people don't satisfy us. Only God truly satisfies us. But David adds here for us another dimension of our delight. To delight in God is to delight in his people. And specifically, who David delights in here is the godly. That's what saints and excellent ones is getting at here in the text. David will not delight in other gods, verse 4. David does not delight in the wicked and what they do, verse 4. But instead, David delights in God and his people. His orientation is towards God and his people. And even though God's people can be challenging, even though God's people can be difficult to deal with, and David would certainly know this as king, he would rather delight and associate with God's people than with the wicked. I wonder here this morning... What is our view of the people of God? Do we delight in the people of God? The same challenges and the same difficulties David faced in his own day with the people of God are the same challenges and the same difficulties we face with one another. You know why we're all the same? Like David's day is because we're human. We're sinners saved by grace. But David says this about the people of God, despite knowing what these people are like, in whom is all my delight? Can we say that this morning about ourselves and our church? Do we delight in this body of believers? Do we look forward to our time with the saints of God? Do we love the church as much as we claim to love the Lord himself? We can't say yes to God and yet say no to his people. We can't say we love God and not love his people. Yes, we're not easy, we're not perfect, we're not problem-free, but we are God's people redeemed by God, and God wants us to delight in him, and God wants us to delight in his people. He wants us to delight in the godly. And so we may not delight or run to the wicked, but what good is turning from evil if we do not then turn to what God wants us to turn to? What good is not delighting in wickedness if we do not then delight in what he calls us to delight in? We are to delight in God and we are to delight in his people. That's what David's confession is. That was David's orientation. And may this be our confession and may this be our orientation as well. Now, notice the second point here. We see David's confidence in verses 5 through 8. So why does David confess what he does here about God? He confesses what he does here about God because of who God is. And we find that here in these verses. David has confidence in God because of his ongoing care and presence in his life. Notice the language here, verses 5 through 6. The Lord is my chosen portion. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a beautiful inheritance. So all of this language here in verses 5 and 6 is conquest language. Language used when Israel went into the land and took the land. And what happened once they conquered the land? Each tribe received a portion. They received a, a section, part of the land as an inheritance. But you notice here, David takes that same language and he applies it to God's ongoing care and presence in his life. The confidence that David has in the Lord is not so much in what God has given him. He's already living in the land. The people already had portions of the land. But his confidence is in the presence of the Lord. You see, in the ancient Near Eastern culture, there was no greater commodity than land itself. You had land, you had power, you had land, you were rich, you had land, you had security, but none of that compares to having the Lord. None of that compares to God's presence. What David is saying to us this morning is that the Lord is my portion. The Lord is my inheritance. The Lord is my sustenance. The Lord is my land. It is better to have the Lord than it is to have anything else, even land. 
And God has marked out a place for his people, and that place is the Lord himself. God's presence is not bound to a place or a land or a temple or a structure or a building. His presence is with us by the Spirit through Jesus Christ. This is why wherever you go, whatever you do, wherever you live, you can have confidence in God. Do we realize that this morning? The best gifts that we get are not the gifts themselves, but the best gift we get is the giver of those gifts. And the greatest inheritance that we get is not things, but the greatest inheritance that we have is God himself. We can have everything without God and yet have nothing, or we can have nothing with God and yet truly have everything. And as long as you have God, you have everything. That's why Paul could sit in a Roman prison and be the most content and full and grateful and joyful man in the world because he had God, because God was with him. You know, it's interesting that when Israel went into the land, every tribe got a piece of land but one. And that one tribe that didn't get a piece of land was the tribe of Levi. And you know why they didn't get a piece of land? Because God said to them, I will be your inheritance. Numbers chapter 18, verse 20, it says this, And the Lord said to Aaron, You shall have no inheritance in the land, neither shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion, your inheritance among the people of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 9, Therefore, Levi has no portion or inheritance with his brothers. The Lord is his inheritance, as the Lord your God has said to him. What better inheritance do we have than the Lord himself? And when we believe that God is our portion, God is our cup, God is our lot, God is our inheritance, then we can take all these good gifts that God has given to us and we can use them for his glory. We can give away the things that we have. We can live without things we don't need. And we can be content in whatever place we find ourselves. Because the most important thing we possess is already ours through Jesus Christ. And that's God. We don't need to hold on tightly to things. We don't need to hold on to people tightly. We don't need to hold on to anything tightly. We don't need to hold on to our ministries too tightly. Because we have God and because we have God, we have all that matters. And so again, what better inheritance can we have than God himself? Now notice how David continues to unpack God's presence and care in his life. Look at verses 7 and 8. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. So notice what David is doing here. David, as he has confidence in the Lord, he is also praising the Lord here. But in praising God, he continues to express his confidence. And David is confident in the Lord because God's presence and care, notice it here, is all-encompassing in his life. The Lord gives him counsel. At night, the Lord instructs him in the inner man, and God is with him at his right hand. We could say here that God is with him day and night and every time in between. There is never a time of day or a place or a moment where God's care and God's presence is not there to lead his people, to guide his people, and to care and instruct his people. So picture this with me for a moment. Wherever you go, whatever you do, whatever circumstances you find in your life, God is next to you. God is with you. God is there day and night. And the psalmist says here, he is at my right hand. So we've all heard the statement before, he's my right hand man. What do we mean by that? What we mean by that is that he's got my back. He's my most trusted advisor. He's the one that I can lean on for support. He's the one that I can truly rely upon. And that's what God is for us. To be at our right hand is a place of strength and help. And who better is there to have at our right hand than God himself? And yet what is important for us to notice here is how God's care and presence comes to be part of our lives. Notice what the psalmist says. I have set the Lord always before me. Now what does this statement mean? It means that David is ever mindful of God. It means that the Lord is the ever-consuming focus of David's thought. He meditates on God. He prays to God. He draws upon God through his word. This doesn't take away from the gracious care and presence of God in our lives, but it reminds us here this morning that enjoyment and pleasure from God's presence in our lives comes through engaging God. It comes through encountering God regularly. It comes through fellowshipping with God consistently. God counsels us during the day. He instructs us at night. He is at our right hand. 
But the means by which that presence is powerfully at work in our lives, it is through always setting the Lord before us. This is even what we learned when we first began this psalm series. Psalm chapter 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. That's Psalm 16 again. If you want to experience God's presence in your life, then you need to set the Lord always before you in his word. Opening his word every day of your life, deliberately and intentionally meditating on his word, thoughtfully and patiently praying to God and meditating on God and engaging God. What does James even tell us in James chapter 4, verse 8? Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's a promise, but a command as well. And if we are Christ today, the presence of God doesn't come and go for us. His presence is with us through Christ by the Spirit. But the enjoyment of that presence, the strength that we draw from his presence, the work of his presence in our lives, the kind of stability that comes from God's presence in our lives is given to us when we set the Lord always before us. So this morning, are you intentionally setting the Lord always before you? Are you consistently engaging the presence of God through word and prayer? And if you don't find yourself here this morning having the kind of confidence in the Lord that David has, then is it possible that the Lord is not always set before you? And if that's the case this morning, let me encourage you to turn from that. Repent of that. Repent of your apathy. Repent of your laziness. Repent of your busyness, your sin, and set the Lord always before you. Delight yourself in the Lord and know his loving care and presence in your life. And so we see the confession of David. We see the confidence of David. Now look at the last point here in the text. We see David's hope. So David has confessed God's goodness. David has expressed his confidence in God's presence and care. And now David hopes in God. The same God who is good, the same God who cares for him and is with him in this life is the same God who will not abandon him at death. Notice what happens here. David rejoices. Look at the language of the text again. His heart is glad. His whole being rejoices. His flesh is secure. Why does David rejoice here? Why does David have hope here? Because God will not abandon him at death. Now, some people think here that David is speaking about some crisis that he's facing in his life in which he wants deliverance by God. But I think David is really speaking about here final death. And David's rejoicing is not simply because God rescues him from the grave. Notice it there in the text. He will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. But David rejoices because God's presence and care continues to be with him past the grave. God's good and gracious care and presence does not cease at death. But instead, God's good and gracious care and presence continues on with him past death. That's what David is driving at here in verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. What good is being rescued from the grave if that rescue does not also mean God's presence in our lives? What good would it be to never die but to live forever without God's presence? What good would it be to be raised from the dead only to never experience the presence of God in our lives? You see, that's what hell really is. Hell is the absence of God. The wicked will be raised to eternity, but an eternity without God. And the righteous will be raised to an eternity, but an eternity with God. That's the goal of our lives. The goal of our lives is the eternal presence of God. That was was what was lost in the garden. What was lost in the garden was joy and rest and fullness and satisfaction in the presence of God. We do realize that this morning. That's the entire story of the Bible. God moving sinful men back into his presence. He expelled Adam and the woman out of his presence because of sin. He let Israel into his presence in a limited way under the old covenant. But now he welcomes us back into his presence through Christ. You see, the truth of Psalm 16 is only achieved for us through Christ. And not just through our union to Jesus Christ, but by the very life of Christ. Jesus fulfills Psalm 16. Jesus is the one who was not abandoned to Sheol. Jesus is the Holy One who does not see corruption. This is exactly what Peter preaches at Pentecost. I want you to turn with me over to Acts chapter 2 here, and I want you to see how Peter understands Psalm 16 in his sermon. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 22. 
Peter says this, beginning in verse 22, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, right here from Psalm 16, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced, my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Verse 29. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Do you notice here Peter's argument? He says David did see corruption, therefore David had to be speaking of another person. That's what Peter means here in the text when he calls David a prophet. He foresaw these things. Even though David believed that God would not abandon him, even though David believed that God's presence would be with him forever in his own context, when he wrote Psalm 16, he nonetheless died and he did see corruption. He was dead for thousands of years. And so therefore, Psalm 16 must speak of another person. The words of David are the words of Christ here. God would not abandon David, but God will not abandon the greater David. And the exact and the fullest sense of that is seen in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus did not see corruption, and Jesus was not abandoned to the grave. And because Jesus is raised from the dead, he is the forever offspring of David. God promised to David that one of your offspring will sit on your throne forever. The only way that you sit on thrones forever is if you never die. And that's what the resurrection proves. And so Psalm 16 is not just telling us that Jesus lives forever, but Psalm 16, used by Peter in this passage, is telling us that Jesus is the promised Messiah who brings deliverance to God's people. You see, church, the truth is, is that we don't always delight and trust in God the way this psalm says. The truth is, is that we don't always delight and love God's people the way this psalm says. The truth is, is that we don't always reject wickedness and set the Lord always before us like this psalm says. Even David didn't do that always in his life. And so this psalm had to speak of another. Only Christ faithfully delighted and trusted in God the way this psalm says. Only Christ delighted and loved God's people the way this psalm says. And only Christ forsook evil and always set the Lord before him the way this psalm says. And so therefore, only Christ is the one whose soul is not abandoned to Sheol. Only Christ is the Holy One whose body does not see corruption. You see what Christ does for us. Only Christ secures the blessings of Psalm 16 for us because only Christ has done what Psalm 16 says to us. This is the active obedience of Christ. We not only need the work of Christ at the cross as our wrath bearer, but we need the perfect life of Jesus Christ as well. And because of his delight and his trust in the Lord alone, he alone fulfills Psalm 16. Because of his trust and his delight in God, he alone is raised from the dead to live forever before God. And because he lives forever before God, so those who trust in Christ will also live forever before God. You see, church, that's the confidence that you and I actually have that God will not abandon our souls to the grave. That's the confidence we have that he will not let us see corruption, but will raise us up on that last day. That's the hope that we have, that we will know and enjoy the presence of God forever because of Christ. All of that is secured for us in Christ. And because God has secured all of that for us in Christ, here's what that means in your life. It means this, God will never cast you from his presence. Because of, God's, because of Christ's perfect life and perfect sacrifice, God will never cast his own son from his presence. And if he will not do that to his own son, 
then why would we think that he would ever do that to those who are in his son? God can no more cast you from his presence than he can cast his own son from his presence. You see, church, that's the deeper beauty of the gospel. The beauty of the gospel is not just that God forgives us of our sins through Jesus Christ. This we know, this we rejoice in. But the deeper beauty of the gospel is that God will never send you away. The deeper beauty of the gospel is that he will never say to you, leave me. He will never ignore you. He will never dismiss you. He will never reject you. He will never disregard you. He will never overlook you. He will never neglect you. He will never be embarrassed of you. But instead, God accepts you as he accepts his own son. He welcomes you as he welcomes his own son. He treats you as he treats his own son. He loves you as he loves his own son with an everlasting love. There's nothing that God will ever learn about you later that will surprise him and force him to send you away from his presence. There's nothing about you that God didn't already know about you when he welcomed you into his presence. There is no new piece of evidence that someone can bring up against you that will change God's mind about you in Christ. God saved you knowing the worst about you. God saved you knowing everything about you. Your worst sins, your deepest flaws, your biggest failures, your darkest moments, and yet he still saved you. As J.I. Packer has said, God justified you with his eyes open. God justified you with his eyes wide open. And if God saved you when he knew the worst about you, and not only has saved you, but has accepted you and given you everything that he has given to his son, then why in the world would you ever think that he would forsake you? You know why some of us still think like that? You know why some of us still feel that way? You know why some of us still live in this fear and insecurity? Because we're basing our acceptance before God on us. We're not basing it on Christ. We're basing it on our performance. We're basing it on our morality, our good works, our self-righteousness. We're comparing ourselves to other people. We're finding our identity in other things. We're basing it on how we feel and what we experience. Church, that's not what you base your assurance on. Here's what we base our assurance on, Christ and his righteousness alone. Nothing in this world can overtake God's love for you in Christ. What does Paul say in Romans 8? We know it. For I am sure, that is a man who has assurance, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the love and the delight and the joy and the fullness that the triune God has in himself since before the beginning of the world He invites you and I into that love and that delight and that fullness of joy through the message of the gospel. God hasn't done everything that he has done for us in our lives just to let us down at the end. We have been restored and we have begun to enjoy the presence of God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And one day we will see our God face to face in the person of Jesus Christ. And there we will have pleasures forevermore. What a glorious day that will be in our lives. And so whether you know Christ or you don't know Christ here this morning, let me admonish you to turn to Christ. Look to Christ. Delight in Christ. Set Christ and his righteousness always before you. And rest in that righteousness that has been secured for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the power of your word, the authority of your word in the way your word confronts us, but the way your word also brings us comfort. And I pray, Father, that we would find consolation and comfort in the truth of the gospel this morning. There are those of us who are struggling with pride and arrogance, that, Lord, you would humble us before the cross and remind us that we are sinners in need of your grace. And if we are struggling today with insecurity and lack of assurance, that, Lord, you would lift us up and help us to see who and what we now are in Jesus. Strengthen our hearts wherever we are. Comfort our hearts, we pray. We pray, Lord, that you would do this to make us more like Christ and to bring yourself glory. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.